Ashland, Oregon. That's the classic shape of a California giant sequoia. Notice the dry brown hills in the background. This is not the Sierras. This is not home habitat of giant sequoia. Yet people have been planting these magnificent conifers in Oregon and Washington State for many decades. How well do they do this far inland in the Pacific Northwest? And how will they fare in this century of human-caused climate change? Welcome to Episode 9E of Climate, Trees, and Legacy. I'm Connie Barlow. This is the fifth in the series about redwoods and sequoias that have already inadvertently been moved north of their traditional homes in California owing to landscapers planting them up to a century ago. Uh, assisted migration of these trees and other native species will probably be important in the decades ahead unfortunately, of severe and all too rapid climate change. So it's important to document where sequoias and redwoods have already been planted by landscapers, inadvertently, not for climate change, and to see how they're doing and to learn about what kinds of human help do they need in their new homes. Now, the first four segments in this series dealt with the coastal areas of uh, Seattle, Portland, uh, pretty much in the, the rain belt area, the fog area. And both sequoias and redwoods seem to do very well there, especially the sequoias as they're more drought resistant and cold resistant. This time I'm going inland, film uh, videos that I've made, oh, in the last year or so of inland locations that are much drier and to some extent colder documenting how the trees do. And so you're going to see several locations here. Uh, fortunate to talk with several of the people who know much about how they were planted. And then learn that overall, inland is not a place to plant redwoods, coast redwoods. They require more rain, more fog, but it looks like giant sequoias. Uh, inland in northern Oregon and inland in uh, Washington State and even into Idaho in the Snake River area might do okay. At least they're there now, at least they're doing okay. I might add uh, that right now it's September 7th, 2017 and I am so fortunate to be here east of Eureka, regrowth redwood area here, Freshwater Creek, one of the restored salmon streams in this area, and we broke records here all along the west coast this year for high temperatures. Here in Eureka, the high that broke the all-time record for any day in the year in any year, last Saturday, 87 degrees, okay? Fog. This is a naturally cool area. Redwoods love it here. So do banana slugs. But further south in San Francisco, they broke an all-time record, 109 degrees, and it's usually about 30, 35 degrees Fahrenheit warmer over um, east of here, out of the fog zone. To the north of us, Oregon and even, well, northern California north of us here too, uh, to some extent in Washington and all over British Columbia, forest fires everywhere. Uh, we know two people in Oregon, one in Northern Oregon, one in Southern Oregon, who right now have been evacuated from their homes. They don't know whether their homes are going to burn up because the fire personnel cannot protect their homes in the landscapes that they're in. So it's just a matter of whether they get rain like we're having now and how the wind conditions shift. Um, about 10 days ago, 12 days ago, Hurricane Harvey who's uh, certainly the moisture content and the flooding was enhanced by climate change already underway, hit Texas area. We have family in Houston. Uh, we're just two days before Hurricane Irma seems on course to be hitting Florida. It's going to soon be hitting into the Hispaniola area 
as well. And that too, in terms of the storm surge, the power of the storm, not that it's caused by climate change, but that climate change exacerbates these things. I would hazard a guess that by the end of this year, 2017, well more than half of Americans will admit that climate change is underway, it's human caused, it's desperate, and that we need to start doing something about it. The red stars signify the places that I'll be documenting in this video where people have already planted members of the Redwood Clan. All of these places are inland because they're east of the Cascade Mountains, so they're drier than the places to the west. The very beginning of this video documented a couple of giant sequoias that were in Ashland, Oregon. And now we're going to scoot up just a little to the north, to Medford. And there we're going to take a look at a coast redwood. February 3rd, 2017, this is Frank Callahan, a local here. We're in Medford, Oregon. This is Hawthorne Park. We got a big street behind us. Talk to us about, about these redwoods and where's their native range and how well are they doing? Actually, the coast redwood, the native range, goes all the way up to southwest Oregon near Brookings. And we're at about that same latitude right here if we were to go west here oh. in Hawthorne Park. This tree was planted from seedlings uh, taken from the coast and uh, has grown into a monster redwood, as you can see. It's divided several times. It's actually the three major trunks up, a, up, up at a little bit of height. These trees get to be enormous. And these in the park here are about 135 to 140 feet tall. Wow, do you know what, how old they are, probably? Uh, these are probably around 50 to 60 years old. Okay, now let's uh, walk around to the other side because we have a basal sprout, which redwoods do, but these uh, giant sequoias do not. You'll notice right here that we have a, a terminal uh, point on this and uh, several laterals. Well, if anything happens to the parent tree, this will take over. Why doesn't the giant sequoia, why doesn't it have basal sprouts? That's a good question. Uh, we really don't know. Uh, the coast redwood has, has developed this uh, alternative way of survival where the uh, giant sequoia has not. There's no basal sprouting at all, but they put out a tremendous seed crop. Yes. And as soon as the duff is removed, those seeds come up like grass. Right. So after a fire or any kind of disturbance, you get the uh, seedlings coming up. So you really probably don't need the basal sprout system that the redwood, the coast redwood is using. So the Sierra redwood is making it basically through seed production. Nobody artificially waters these trees. Um, how do these survive a, a long summer drought? Uh, well, what's going on here is it's not very far to groundwater. Because Bear Creek was just a short distance from here. There's a tremendous groundwater supply feeding Bear Creek. And technically, if it weren't diked up, this is the, this is the old flood pl yes, plain. That, we are in the flood plain, okay. But in general, Coast redwoods don't come in this far inland from the coast of Oregon because you get more drought here, but they can still make rain with fog, right? You talk right. about, do you still get fog here? Oh yes, we get a lot of fog in the winter, and that fog is unmeasurable precipitation. You never hear about it in the weather reports, right. but you put a, a can down and monitor that precipitation that comes off the tree, and sometimes you get two to three inches of water out of a major fog for a week of fog. Wow, so, and that's just under the canopy. Under the you canopy. walk three feet out beyond there and it's dry. Yeah. Trees yeah. are condensers, yeah. especially conifers. Yeah. So that's where this extra water comes from. And you know what's interesting for me is the Olympic Peninsula, uh, the foresters who do, research foresters who do climate modeling using IPCC data, 
they show that the Douglas fir is going to go out on the Olympic Peninsula by the end of the century, actually well before the end of the century. But they can't predict whether coast redwoods will come in because the climate models that they take from the IPCC and then put their species tree physiologies to, the models won't show fog. So they can't figure out where the coast redwoods would be. But what we do know, and what I've documented, there are tons of particularly sequoias, but also coast redwoods already on the Olympic Peninsula, west side of Puget Sound, over in the Seattle area, northwards. They are everywhere. And doing well. And doing well, exactly. All right, thank you. Frank Callahan here in Medford, Oregon. Three years ago, June 2014, I gave a public presentation in Durango, Colorado, showing the research maps of how 10 conifer species native to Colorado were projected to have severe range contractions in the decades ahead. One of the 10 was the interior variety of Douglas fir. Here's a clip of how I described the situation. All right, we've covered our two spruce. Let's take a look at, uh, uh, well, let's do Douglas fir. Douglas fir, as you know, is not a true fir. It's just called that. Let's take a look, a very widespread species. I love Douglas fir in part because it's so easy to tell what it is. If I can run my hand over it back and forth, it ain't a spruce, right? Mm -hmm. Here's Douglas fir now, and truly the first place I got to know Douglas fir, I lived in the Seattle area for five years after I moved down. I was in Alaska for 10. But I assumed Douglas fir was a wet coastal species, and I've been surprised out of my mind here in the interior in the Rocky Mountains, seeing where the same species, where it can live. 20, 30, 2060, 2090. Now, one thing to consider here, as you've seen it retract from this area to where it is now, here's Olympic National Park. It doesn't mean it's going to be treeless. What it means is somebody else is going to be moving in there. Okay? If that somebody else can get there. It's projected it's probably going to be redwoods. There were people I knew that already had some redwoods planted on their property. And the, the lore then was about once every 20 years it gets too cold and it kills them back. Well, I've been back there, you know, 20 years later and the trees are still there. We've just looked at giant sequoias in Ashland, Oregon, and one coast redwood in Hawthorne Park of Medford, Oregon. And again, that's just north but well inland of the native range of the coast redwood, but far north of the native range of the giant sequoia of the west slope of the Sierras. Now we'll look at two residential properties up at the Washington-Oregon border along the Columbia River in Hood River. Both of these locations have giant sequoias. The first is a rather new planting that is also stunted by shade, but the second, now that's a pair of giants. Let's begin, Hood River. Yeah, this was planted uh, about 20 years ago, and it's got a little competition for light, so it's kind of squeezed under this maple tree. We're in Hood River, Oregon, and I planted one in my mother's house about 15 years ago. It gets full light, lots of water, it's about four times the size. Is it a redwood or a it's, sequoia? It's a sequoia. My father was a ranger in Sequoia National Park, and he and my mom lived in the backcountry. And so I was conceived in the redwoods, or at least the thought of me was. <laughs> I'm not sure which, but I love sequoias. Right, <laughs> and so it was, it was that that led you to think about why you wanted to plant a sequoia on your mom's property. Right, I'd plant one at my place in Mosier, but I think it's too dry. I'd have to like give it lots and lots of water. And uh, I'm sending you to my friend Peter's house. He's got the two biggest ones in town that are on each side of his driveway. They're spectacular. Okay, so
So the house was built about 1930, and we think the trees were planted about that same time. Um, they're uh, California sequoias, uh, not the coastal redwood. Um, and their needles are kind of sharp. They're, uh, they're a tree that does well with less water um, than the, the coastal redwoods. And there are other redwoods in Hood River that I'm aware of. One is down next to the Sixth Street Bistro. But there's two planted just like this in Carson, Washington, which is uh, across the river about 20 miles away, um, on either side of a walkway into a house. They're obviously beautiful trees. I think they're a selling feature for some people. They're also, it's also a problem when you have trees this big in residential neighborhoods because this tr these trees have gone out, they've girdled the sewer pipe several times, and, <laughs> and we've had to have major sewer work down out in the street. Oh. Uh, this particular tree is leaning to the east, and so if it ever fell, it wouldn't fall on us, it'd fall on our nearby neighbor's house, which would be a real disaster. Uh, but I think they've got pretty good root structure. I just think these are, these are great trees to own if, if you have enough space and if you want to uh, a fast growing big tree, this is a, a great candidate. They're, they're quite a bit bigger than your home. <laughs> for somebody like me, this would be a selling point. For yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it was for us. Um, there's another redwood down the street. So the, the sequoias have this beautiful conical shape. Oh, they do. Yes. And We've. Oh, there it is. This tree had that shape. Oh, it what happened to the top? It, it received a lightning bolt last summer. Oh, just last summer. And it, Blew a third of the top out, landed in the in this backyard, and left the other two thirds splintered. Oh my and gosh! They, but it's still alive. It's still alive. They they brought in a crane. They snaked it through the the power lines. Wow! They grabbed a hold of the top, and they had somebody go up there and, and yeah. cut the top off, yeah. and then they lowered the wow. pieces down. Wow! But that used to be as big or bigger than our trees, now yeah. our trees are the biggest. Yeah, sure. Well, they're the next for the lightning, huh? <laughs> yeah. I'm quite worried about it, yeah, actually. Yeah. You can see these two trees side by side as you cross the Hood River Bridge. Oh, wow. We'll leave Oregon now and head east and a bit north to Walla Walla, Washington. After that, we'll transit over to Lewiston, Idaho. Crucial to know is that while Medford, Oregon was about 1,400 feet elevation and Ashland was 2,000 feet elevation, all three of the locations near the Columbia and eastward into the Snake River are surprisingly low elevation for that far inland. Hood River is 160 feet. Walla Walla elevation is 942 feet. And Lewiston, even farther east, is just 740 foot elevation along the Snake River. Now, those low elevations are thanks to a catastrophic ice dam flood that burst through the northeast part of what is now Washington State and what was then glaciated during the Pleistocene. Basically, warm marine air in the winter slithers its way all up the Columbia and well into the Snake River by Lewiston. Our journey now continues in Walla Walla, Washington, Pioneer Park, on a glorious warm autumn day, November 6, 2016. I found just this one giant sequoia at the south end of the park, near the aviary. Behind it and to the left, in fall color, is the deciduous cousin of California giant sequoia. This is the meta sequoia of China, though millions of years ago, it used to be common throughout the Pacific Northwest and far to the north too. The rest of this Walla Walla video will focus on this meta sequoia, Don Redwood, 
and a grove of three more dawn redwoods at the north end of Pioneer Park. Meta Sequoia. Unlike the redwood, it sheds all its leaves, uh, similarly to the Taxodium here, uh, bald cypress in the eastern USA, but a very easy way to tell it. It's the only one of the redwood Taxodium where the leaflets are opposite one another. Do you see that? Each pair is opposite rather than offset, alternate. So there's, there's kind of a beauty of symmetry in the little branchlets here. And notice the male pollen structures there, very uh, robust. They're, they're going to overwinter and then probably before the leaves come out on this deciduous tree, the pollen will open up and disperse itself. So both male and female on the same tree. So a lot of these cones have been dropping to the ground and I found a few of prior years and this one there, you can actually see in the center, see some seeds still in it. Well, I can't check out that tree on the left because it's occupied. See that hammock there? Uh, that one on the left there, right in the center, that looks like a larch. Definitely a larch. It's not a redwood sequo sequoias cupressus type tree. This one here, I went up and looked at the leaves. This would be a bald cypress. It's native to North America. Only uh, in the southeast Oh, as far up as maybe coastal New York, barely. This is what forms a cypress, bald cypress swamps uh, of Florida and Georgia and so forth. Uh, very wet areas. It can live here just fine, but also in the swamps. You can see it's called bald cypress because in the winter it's deciduous. There's just no way it's, you'd uh, think it was a meta sequoia or a redwood. It's just got its own very distinctive leaf structure. Quite a bit more delicate than the redwoods and uh, the sequoia, uh, the meta sequoia, the dawn redwood. Again, this is uh, Taxodium, bald cypress, native to eastern North America. That's it for Pioneer Park in Walla Walla, Washington. Now on to Lewiston, Idaho, along the Snake River. Elevation only 745 feet above sea level. Before we look at the trees, here is how I learned their story three months after I documented them. February 13, 2017. Story in the Lewiston Tribune. Saving the Sequoias. City leaders planning to keep trees at Orchard's site where new fire station is planned to be built. Here I learned that the trees were planted by the first nursery in Lewiston early in the 20th century and for some reason they were not sold before they became too big to move. When the owner retired in the 1950s, the nursery closed but the six giant sequoias remained. Fortunately, the owners next door watered their lawn so the trees still got watered. In the video itself, I'll point out the evidence, a green garden hose along the sequoias. My husband and I made the expedition to the famous trees in early November 2016. And a friend of ours who grew up in Lewiston, when she heard I was interested in scouting sequoias, sent me this Google Earth photo, or Google Maps photo, of what she thought was sequoias. And so driving along, we put that into our GPS, and look what we have up there. That sure looks like them. So Michael and I are going to walk over there and see if those are sequoias. And you can see we have a variety of landscaped conifers along this road here. Wow, low angle sun. Look at the red. Here's Michael for scale. 
Look at that. Okay. Wow. One, two, three, four, five trunks. That's amazing. One, two, three, four, five, six. Glory, glory. So here I am, standing next to one, just as the sun is setting. The red stars map the inland locations where we can be pretty sure that at least the giant sequoias native to California's Sierras have no difficulty tolerating the cold. But what about the dry? That's a big question. Can they survive at the drier inland locations on their own? Or do humans have to keep watering them, maybe even after they mature? Well, let's remember that our first stop in Hawthorne Park of Medford, Oregon, documented a coast redwood that didn't need watering because it was planted in a floodplain with a high water table. And Pioneer Park in Walla Walla is where we found a young giant sequoia plus several meta sequoias and a water-loving cousin of the redwoods, a bald cypress, who used to live out west too, but is now found only in wet areas of the southeastern USA. There's one other site visit I made that inclines me to think that inland plantings of coast redwoods for sure, and giant sequoias maybe, are best planted in floodplains and watered until their roots get down to the high water table. After then, they may be able to do just fine, even produce seeds with no further human help. The site visit was at Upper Lake, California, a wee bit inland from Coast Redwood Native Range and out of the dependable summer fog. July 2017, we house sat for 10 days at the home of Denise Rushing, whose property includes a large old walnut grove that is never irrigated, thanks to a high water table. Here you will see Denise with Coast Redwoods she herself planted. Here's a little redwood uh, in California that's a part of a little grove that's been planted. And you can see, here come some chickens, um, but you can see that there's, it was attached to, see this little bamboo pole? This may, and I've seen this on a couple other ones too, with that little bamboo pole. And then of course they've got basils and another stem coming up too. But I wonder, if this is why the main stem kind of shows sort of crazy, crazy growth here. Now here's a taller one that's been planted and this is a one that really has crazy looking branches coming out of it. This just looks like the sort of thing you'd find on a rooted branchlet with, look at all this crazy orientation. But as I move up the stem, it does look like there's still some more there, but it looks like some of these are starting into sort of more normal orientation. This is pretty crazy here still. But right as we move up to the top, yeah, see those? And it's got a good leader coming out, so maybe eventually rooted branchlets can turn into regular canopy growing redwoods. What's interesting about this one, it's real thick in there, but I haven't seen any evidence of basal sprouts. So I don't know what the situation is there. And 
Let's see if I can ask the owner of this property who would have planted these little redwoods and ask her what's going on. So this is Denise Rushing, who's the author of Tending the Soul's Garden. Uh, the subtitle is Permaculture. As a way forward in difficult times. Great. And I, we've been dog sitting, tree sitting, chicken sitting here while she and her partner have been uh, visiting family and so forth and just enjoyed it. Tell us, um, Denise, where are we and who is this next to you? Okay, so we're in Upper Lake, California, which is in Lake County. And it's a volcanic region. It was formed over time. We, uh, it's dominated by Clear Lake, which is one of the oldest lakes in the Northern Hemisphere and one of the most biologically diverse. The little, it, the little valleys around here, in fact, in fact, I think this area was really known for its sawmills. And so the valleys that sort of lead up into the watershed had um, different kinds of pines and redwoods. And um, this is actually, I believe, a coastal redwood. Um, it was one that I bought for a dollar when we traveled through the Redwood Highway. and It was maybe this big when we got it. And I suspect it probably was a branch, a tree branch that had been rooted. Anyway, it, um, I, put, I bought them and put them in little pots and then grew them maybe two feet tall and then I transplanted them around the farm. So our farm is 11 acres, mostly walnuts, and these trees have been, the walnut trees have been here for probably 90 years, most of them. Um, this tree is maybe um, six years, seven years old, probably. Um, and it's required, obviously, a lot of water to kind of keep it going. But we do have a very high water table here. So once it gets established, the water table is probably, most years, it's seven or eight foot below the ground. And in a drought year, it might go down to 16 feet. So it's certainly possible uh, to dry farm the walnut trees. And I suspect that um, these little redwoods can finally maybe find, and they're kind of shallow rooted trees, but I think that they can maybe make their way seven or eight feet down. So. And is this about as far inland as redwoods would have grown naturally with the sawmills that were here and everything? I think so. I think the only places redwood was, would grow here would be in little microclimates that would be uh, valleys. So we see a lot of oaks. In fact, you'll see as you walk along Pitney Lane, there are a lot of oaks that have found their way near the streams. And mostly it's an oak grassland habitat that would be burned by fire and then uh, the underbrush would be cleared out and the oaks would dominate the landscape. But um, in some of the valleys, there's fog that, that lingers and those places you might find some redwoods. So each of the trees, when they were in little five-gallon five pots, they got a stake. And um, then I bought some, some stakes to sort of hold them up when we first planted them in the okay. ground. Okay, let's go to these two over here, because you mentioned to me that um, these, you got these um, yeah, from Costco, so they were probably... They were, they were probably um, my shoulder height when we got them. Right, and so they, these are normal looking trees, so they were probably grown from seed instead of rooted branchlets, huh? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, and how old are these? Uh, let's see. I don't know when Costco planted them, but mm -hmm. I got them probably six years ago. Oh, and and you're still watering them? Um, from time to time, yes. We have a very high water table here, so my ho and we also have a creek right behind you, right? Seasonally, so um, they should be getting close to not needing much water. Now, what about those? Um, redwoods over there uh, between the neighbor and this property. Yeah, I planted those. You planted those? Yeah. They're huge. Yeah, I planted them when I first got here. And are they normal kind or are they weird? They're normal. Yeah, I th and I, I, I saw some basils under there. And do they get watered anymore? Uh, they have been watered, but I don't, we don't really water them, no. Okay. So yes, it's very important to learn the history, usually oral history, of any plantings that offer opportunities to learn about where and how a tree species of interest might be able to grow under different climate regimes, that is, outside its current native range. So that's it for this fifth segment of the Sequoia Redwoods series. 
The next one will go back in time. What does the fossil record tell us about where members of the Redwood Clan used to grow in North America? And how do we interpret the fossils to help us get a jump start in assisting the migration of these giants, sadly, in anticipation of rapid and severe climate warming and drying this century in the western USA? I'm watching a banana slug right down here enjoying the rain. May the forest be with you.